Good, good, good. Well, we have much to cover. We have much to, uh, to look from the Word of God. So let's begin with the Word of Prayer. Father in heaven, help me and clear our thoughts from any distraction. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. If this is your first time coming to the Cleveland First Seventh-day Adventist Church, this message might take you by surprise. And I encourage you to go to our website, ClearburnSCA.com, and uh, listen to previous messages, uh, last Sabbath or the weeks before, because we are dealing with the Antichrist. And so, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And just as a review, we've spent the entire summer dealing with the Sabbath, and dealing how the Sabbath plays an important role for God's people. We look at the Sabbath in the New Testament. And so, why did I spend so much time on the Sabbath for these next couple of weeks? Because the Sabbath will play the role in the last days. And so, so but we're, we are propping up just for that just now. And so just as a review, we looked at last week, Daniel chapter 7, that, that beast, and also Revelation 13, that beast that was similar. Same characteristics, same description, and same power. And the Bible tells us that a beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom or a nation. Daniel 7 uh, tells us that, and, and we, we review that last Sabbath as well. And so now, from what the Bible tells us, that we saw last week, Revelation 13, 1 through 9, uh, 10, and Daniel 7, according to the scripture and according to history and the accounts of history, who is this Antichrist power? It's the papal system, the Roman papal Catholic church state. Uh, and notice I say the Roman system. Not Catholic people. There are many sincere Catholic individuals. I want to go on record on saying that for sure. Um, I am not talking against people or against people. And as I said last week, there are Catholics that are more devoted even than Adventists. They have a zeal. They, ha they just need to be exposed to the Word of God, friends. And once they do, as my, as, as my grandfather would say, your best Seventh-day Adventists will be ex-Catholics because, because they have that zeal to, to serve God. And so, so I am not talking against people, but against the system and what it represents and what it believes as well. So we saw that already. So now here in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Verse 8 says... Talking about this first beast, the papal system, and all who dwell on the earth. How many here dwell on the earth? Everybody does, right? That means all of us. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Talking about the beast. Talking about the Antichrist system. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. There will be two groups, two camps. You are e you are either with the world wandering after the beast or you are either faithful to the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. It's, 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 it's that simple. You will hear, how do I know it's, it's, it's that simple? Because the Bible prophesies it. And God does not lie. God does not lie. So if God says here that all the earth will worship him except those whose names have been written in the book of life, in the book of the Lamb, that means everybody will. Everybody will. And so, we saw also that Antichrist isn't just, isn't just a name for somebody against Christ, like that hates Christ. No, but that wants to replace Christ. He wants to take his place. And we saw that that, that spirit first began with Lucifer wanting to, ex to exhort himself above heaven and to to be like the Most High and to be worshipped. So this, this power here in Revelation 13 
takes that position. They want to be worshipped. They, they claim to be God on earth. They claim the power to forgive sin. To forgive sin. Jesus even tells us in Matthew 23 verse 9, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for you have one heavenly father. Jesus here isn't talking about your parental father and mother. He's talking about like we call God our father. We are taught to pray our what? Father which are in heaven. And Jesus here says, don't call anyone a father. No one can take the place of your, your heavenly father. Absolutely no one. So we're going to see, we're going to see now, we, we've seen that, that this counterfeit wants to replace Jesus. It's, but not just Jesus, but even the ministry of Jesus. Even Jesus, how he ministered, he counterfeits that ministry as well. I wouldn't call it ministry, but uh, his work, his work. And so we're, we're going to see here the ministry of Christ and the Antichrist, Jesus Christ and the Antichrist. <clears throat> and we're going to see here, when did Jesus begin his ministry? When did Jesus begin his ministry? When he was baptized, right? We we have no record in the, in the Bible before his baptism, going out, healing, teaching, uh, until he is baptized there. And when he's baptized, he comes out of the water, and the Bible says what? He is filled with the Holy Spirit, comes descending like a dove, and the voice of God is heard. And the voice of God is heard. And then he goes out to the wilderness, spends time with God, and, and, and right away begins calling his disciples. Right away begins his work, begins his ministry begins his ministry and then how long did the ministry of Jesus last he ministered for three and a half years he was he ministered for three and a half years or we can say he ministered for time time and half a time or we can say he ministered for 42 months is that familiar language and did Jesus Christ receive a deadly wound yes he did on the cross of Calvary. Yes. But praise the Lord, that wound was healed and was resurrected on the third day. Amen? Amen? Thank God. Praise Jesus. So the Antichrist, the counterfeit, similarly also worked. There, Revelation 13, verse 1. You see there where, where, it, said that, where it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw the beast rising, rising, rising up out of the the sea out of the water just how Jesus began his ministry when he was baptized and came up out of the water and was filled with the Holy Spirit and his ministry began this power also comes out of the water to begin this evil work and how long does the Bible say that he did his work there Revelation chapter 13 verse 5 and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemous and he was given authority to continue for what? 42 months which is three and a half years. Prophetic years. Very, very, very similar. And this Antichrist power also received a deadly wound. There in verse 3. Now the beach which I saw was like a leopard. No, I'm sorry, verse 3. And I saw as one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly heal, his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So are you seeing the similarities between Jesus Christ, the real Christ, Christ means the real Messiah, to the counterfeit. That he begins also out of the water, that he ministers for three and a half years, and he also receives a deadly wound. Well, there's more than that, friends. There is more than that. If you turn your Bibles to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And as, you, as, you're, as you're going there, I need you to really, really, really follow along with, with me here. You have God the Father, yes? And God the Father sent a representative to earth. Who was that? Jesus Christ. He sends Jesus. He ministers for three and a half years. And then after his resurrection and spent a couple of days there with his disciples, where, is he, he, where does he go? Where is he now? He's in heaven. But does he leave us alone? 
No, what does he do? He sends the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, John 16, verse 7 and 8. Jesus says, John 16, verse 6 and, no, no, yeah, 7 and 8. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And he has come. No, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. So praise the Lord that God did not leave us alone. And actually, when you study history, even, even from the beginning, the, when, at, when our first parents sinned, God was the first one to take the initiative to go look for us. For us. So God the Father sends his son. And not just in the, in, in the New Testament, even in the Old Testament. It was Jesus who was with Israel. And then when Jesus leaves, after ministering, after working here on earth, he sends the comforter, the helper to us. Do you think that the Antichrist would have also a helper? Yes. You have Satan. Satan has his representative for three and a half years. And then this representative is going to have a helper. Just, 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 like, just like God. So here we see Revelation 13 verse 11 and 12. Our topic for today. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horn like and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He and he exercised how do we know he is a helper? Right here verse 12. He exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Is he helping the first beast? Yes. Absolutely. Whose deadly wound was healed. That last part of the verse, we know it's talking about the first beast in Revelation 13. In case some people may say, oh, well, we don't know what the first beast, it could be one in Daniel. No, it tells us the beast whose deadly wound was healed. That's the first beast there in Revelation 13. So let's look at some of the identification marks there that, that who is this second beast that is helping the papacy, that is helping the first beast. Well, one of its characters is that, well, it is a beast. And we know that Bible prophecy tells us that a beast is a nation, a kingdom, okay? But it came out of the earth. Did you, did, did you notice that in verse 11? Then I saw an, another beast coming up out of the earth. Coming up out of the earth. Another characteristic that, that we see is that it has horns. But horns like a lamb. And the third characteristic is that it speaks like a dragon. It speaks like a dragon. So we know that a beast represents a, a nation... You can see that in Daniel 7, verse 17 and 23. But what about coming up out of the earth? Now all the other beasts, even the first one came up out of the sea. Even the ones in Daniel 7 came up out of the sea and the sea. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 17 that the seas represent what? Peoples, nations, and tongues, a populated area. But this beast doesn't come out of a populated area. Instead of coming up out of the sea, it comes up out of the earth. So instead of a populated area, it comes out of an unpopulated area. That means it cannot come where at this time most of the population was over in Europe's side of the world. It needs to arise somewhere else. It needs to arise somewhere else. And the other characteristic is that it has two horns like a lamb. Two horns like a lamb. Now the Bible here in Revelation the word lamb is used 29 times in the, Revelation, in the book of Revelation. Most used in any other book in the Bible. And every time it's used, it is referencing Jesus. The Lamb of God. The Song of the Lamb. It is referencing Jesus. So this kingdom, this kingdom will have two horns that somehow represent Jesus. Because their horns but horns like a lamb. 
And we see also there in Daniel 7, verse 24, that what, is, what do horns represent in the Bible? Kings or kingdoms. You, re, you remember there where this first beast has ten horns, you know, those ten kingdoms in Rome as well. And so this, this beast has two horns, two kingdoms, but those two kingdoms have somehow Christ-like characteristics because they're like lamb horns and the lamb represents Jesus Christ. So let's look at two kingdoms that Jesus recognized. John chapter 18. John chapter 18. We, we're we're going to see these two kingdoms that Jesus recognized and see if they apply to this beast. John chapter 18 verse 36. John 18, 36, the Bible here. Jesus is talking. And he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. If he's saying his kingdom is not from here, he's recognizing at least two kingdoms. My kingdom is not from here. That means that his kingdom is from somewhere else, which is heaven. So he's, he, we see here Jesus recognizing two kingdoms. His kingdom and the one here on earth. The heavenly kingdom and the earthly kingdom. The earthly kingdom. So John chapter 19, you're there in John. Just look at the next chapter. Chapter 19 verse 11. And here he's talking to Pilate. And he tells Pilate, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivers me to you has the greater sin. So here Jesus is letting Pilate know where he got his power from. Where did he get his kingdom, his power from? So who established the earthly kingdom? Jesus answered again, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. God gave Pilate the power to be the civil power here on earth. So Jesus here is recognizing, recognizing the civil power, but not just recognizing, he even sets up the civil power, the earthly power here. He's telling Pilate, you wouldn't be king, you wouldn't be, well not king, but you wouldn't be ruling if it wasn't for who? If it wasn't for God. God gave that to you. God gave that to you. So God established the state power. And notice Matthew chapter 16. Turn with me to chapter 16. We're going to see there who established then God's kingdom. Matthew chapter 16. And verse 18 and 19. Here he, here he is talking to Peter and says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of, hell, of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of who? Of heaven. Of heaven. Of heaven. So there we see that who established the church? God did. Who, who established the state? God did. God did. God recognizes both of these kingdoms. Just look at there in Matthew chapter 22. You're there in Matthew still. Look at chapter 22. And verse 17 through 19. They are trying to trap Jesus. And telling and, uh, and, and asking him whether they should pay taxes or not. There are 17 that says, Tell us therefore what, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, verse 18, perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought to him a denarius and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And what did Jesus say? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. 
Jesus here is recognizing both kingdoms. You give to Caesar, to the state, what belongs to him, that kingdom, and also to the kingdom of God, what belongs to God. Do we have a financial responsibility to Caesar today? Yes. Yeah. What's that, what's that called? Taxes. It's called taxes. And if you don't fulfill your, that obligation, they'll come looking for you. <laughs> but we have that obligation to Caesar today. Do we have an obligation to God today? Yes. To God's kingdom? What is, what is that called? Tithe. Tithe and offerings, absolutely. Tithe and offerings. Both kingdoms have to be sustained. Both kingdoms. We cannot get rid of taxes. As much as we'd like to, we, we need taxes. For the state and everything to, to, to work and continue in the way that it should. And we need tithe and offerings for the church to continue to function. You need both. Both kingdoms have to be sustained, but they have to be sustained separately. They have to be sustained separately. If you are a Christian, you have dual citizenship. Did you know that? You are citizens of heaven. Philippians 3.20 tells us our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. If we are a child of God, we are citizens of God, citizens of heaven but also a citizen of a country here in this world. Of a con somewhere here, whether the, whether, the whether the United States or anywhere else. So this kingdom, this kingdom that rose there in Revelation chapter 13, has, has these two principles, these two kingdoms in it, in the nation. In the nation. Both the civil and the religious power as well and there is only one nation that fits these characteristics oh I'm sorry there is only one nation that fits these characteristics and that nation is the beautiful United States of America you see the beast the nation is going to have two kingdoms that Christ, that Christ recognized and we saw these these two kingdoms that Christ Recognize. And the fathers of this nation, the fathers of this nation knew the consequences of a kingdom where church and state were united. They knew the consequences. They knew what happened to John Huss. They knew what happened to Jerome when the church was also ruling like a state. And so when they came to this part of the earth, which was unpopulated, different, they decided that church and the state would be separate, would not join together. Even in early colonial America, those who know the history, in early colonial America, there was forced religion. But when our fathers founded this nation, they say, we will not have any of that. The United States is the first nation to embrace these two principles, civil liberty, civil, liber civil liberty, Basically, another word for that is republicanism. It, it, it doesn't mean the Republican Party. Republicanism. That means that the, gov the people can govern themselves. They don't need a king. They don't need a king. If you notice, did, did, the, did the horns have a crown? On the second beast, no. On the first beast, they had crowns. Only kings were crowns. And this nation would have no king. It would be a Republican. When we pledge allegiance to the flag, we pledge to the Republican that it stands for. But not just civil liberty, praise the Lord, religious liberty as well. Religious liberty as well. Which, another word for that can, can be mentioned as pro Protestantism. A church with no pope and a, and a nation with no king. This nation came also to remember after the deadly wound because here in the first beast in Revelation 13 you see there that it gets a deadly wound a deadly wound and that wound happened in 1798 you can research this and we've seen this in, in other studies since 1798 Napoleon took the Pope captive and just took him from there and he died in in captivity and many people thought that the Catholic Church was done with, with no pope. 
it did receive a deadly wound, but the Bible says that its wound would be healed. Its wound would be healed. So the United States is the only nation that practices these two kingdoms. Kingdom of God and the kingdom of the state. Read, whenever you have time, Romans 13. Romans 13 is very clear of the two kingdoms. Where, where, where Paul says, you, you follow the law as your responsibility and you also follow the laws of, 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 of God. And they have both, Paul mentions it in Romans 13, they have both been set up by God. Both of them have been set up by God. So I believe that God opened this nation right on time. I really do. Praise the Lord. When people were looking for a way out of forced worship, God opened this nation right on time. And I am happy to be a citizen of the United States of America where here, the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created, what? Equal. equal. Friends, this is revolutionary. Yeah. Are created equal. Men and women. Over, over in, in Europe, you know, in the Vatican, in the kings, that, that equalness didn't exist. Okay, you had your hierarchy levels. The king was not equal to the peasants. But in this country, what? All men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain un, unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Amen and amen. These ideas, friends, were new. These ideas were new. And here it continues in the First Amendment of the Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. What establishment mean? Setting it up. No, no, no. They're not going to make it. They're, they're not going to do that. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In the United States, friends, here, today, if you want to worship this speaker, and you want to make a religion out of worshiping this speaker, you have the liberty to do that. Amen. I mean, it's silly. <laughs> but you have the freedom to worship anything you want, as long as you don't violate somebody else's um, privacy. Other than that, you can worship in any way, any day you want. And friends, that, that is revolutionary because over in Rome, that did not exist. They said, they said you worship how we say or else. And the king says, jump. <laughs> what's, what's the answer? How high? You do what we say. And yet, when this nation was built, was came. It came with these two characteristics that Jesus recognized. The civil liberty, freedom from a king, and religious liberty, freedom from a pope. Worship in, to your own conscience. And the people can govern themselves. The people can govern themselves. Great Controversy, page 441, says, the Constitution guarantees to the people the rights of self-government, providing that representatives elected by the popular vote shall enact and administer the law. Isn't that what we do as a church as well? Does the conference over here in Alvarado send me a letter of who's going to be first head deacon, who's going to be um, Dorcas leader? Do they tell? No. We as a people choose and vote and decide. And so here, by the popular vote, shall enact and administer the law. Freedom of religion, faith was also granted every man being permitted to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience. Praise the Lord. And notice, republicanism and Protestantism became the fundamental principles of the nation. These principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. That's powerful, friends. These. What's the these? Freedom of religion and freedom from a king. 
Now sometimes some people want to act as kings. Hmm. And so here it says that it is the secret for this nation. It's not intelligence or more weapons. No, no, no. Here, these principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. So if we want to lose our power and prosperity, those are going to have to say bye-bye. But I wish, friends, that you know, it, here the chapter of the prophecy ended here, but it doesn't. Because it says there in verse 11 that this great nation shall speak like a dragon. Shall speak like a dragon. How does a nation speak? It speaks through its laws. And notice it says he exercises all the authority of the first beast. The United States will exercise the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, friends. There in Revelation 13 verse 12 he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes notice that what's another word to cause what's that mean force. to force and force the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast who's the first beast the papacy right to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed at this time the wound is healed and here, God is telling us through prophecy which His word has always come true. Amen. It's telling us that this great nation that we love, that I love, that I pledge allegiance to, that I sing the national anthem at every baseball game, will soon speak like a dragon. That not just speak like a dragon, but force the earth to worship the first piece. You may be thinking, no, 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 no. That's not going to happen. That would, be, that would be violating the Constitution. You're right. It would be violating the Constitution. Absolutely. Next time, friends, we're going to see on how our Constitution is already being violated. Is already being violated. And slowly, slowly, and slowly, the United States and the papacy are joining together. Are joining together. The wound, the wound of the first beast is being healed. The papacy that once ruled the Dark Ages, friends, is going to come back. It's going to come back. If you look at there on your meditation, on the back of your bulletin, Here from Great Controversy, page 588, kind of in the middle of it, a little bit, it says, The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism, which they reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of, the, of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling of the rights of conscience. Friends, when she wrote this, people thought she was crazy. You know why? In early America, people wanted nothing to do with the Vatican. Nothing to do. They knew their history and they knew uh, what causes when church and state are together. But now today, we see this joining happening more and more and more and more. The deadly wound is being healed. It hasn't been completely healed. Because if it, if in order for it to be completely healed, it needs to return to how it used to rule during the three and a half years. It will. But slowly and slowly, we are reaching over and joining with them. Here in the 1980s, oh, too bad you can't see it that good. But you remember Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, dealt a lot with the Pope here in Holy Alliance. It says, how Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's, oh, I can't read that, movement, alliance, and hasten the demise of communism. How they joined together. This was in the, in the 80s. 
We see also there the Pope, and here you can see in this U.S. news, can the enforcer become the uniter? It's, that's interesting language, the enforcer. That, that kind of sounds like, um, and calls people here in the verse. Time Magazine, why the Pope loves America? Oh, I can tell you why. And the Bible tells us why. Rolling, rolling stones. If there was a last person I would expect to see on Rolling Stones would be the Pope. But here, this Pope Francis, which is coming this, this next month, at the end of the month, coming to Philadelphia. It says here, the, time, the times, they are a changing. A changing. You know, even the language. You know, he wants to be known as the cool Pope that gets along with everyone else. Friends, times are changing. Times are changing, friends. Times are changing. The United States and the Vatican, friends, are getting closer and closer, more together and together. And maybe you have remembered the funeral of John Paul II. This is the first time in U.S. history that a president assists a papal funeral. And not just one president, there, well, you can't see too good, but there you have George Bush Sr., George Bush Jr., Bill Clinton. Three presidents. And not just assisting a funeral, friends, they are kneeling down before a man. Yeah. Kneeling down before the Pope, a dead Pope. And he shall exercise all the authority of the first beast. The most powerful people kneeling before the Pope, friends. If that doesn't tell you anything, friends, you ain't paying attention. The U.S. has never had an ambassador in the Vatican. Has never. We've never needed one. We are fine on our, on our own. And the United States has always been fine on its own. But President Reagan changed that in 1984 and put an ambassador in the Vatican. But friends, I want to close, and we can turn, turn, back, turn back on the lights. I want to close there with Revelation 13, verse 12. What is the purpose of the second beast? Calls the earth who dwell in it to worship the first beast. To worship the first beast. It will cause, it will force you to worship the first beast. But, 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 but what if you don't want to worship? The Bible has the answer for you. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 tells us, you don't want to worship? It says, he, this great nation, was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast I'm sorry, the he is the first king, is the first beast. Was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? Killed. To be killed. To be killed. You don't want to worship? Fine, we'll take care of you. Don't think they won't do it. There's going to be a death penalty regarding worship, friends. A death penalty regarding worship. Amen. Let me just step on the little toes here, friends. Some of us have trouble coming to church on Sabbath, waking up. If there is a death penalty, how are you even going to wake up then? If right now you can't get up to come to church. Friends, how is this going, how is this, uh, this second beast going to enforce it? We're, next time, we're going to cover that. Okay? I, don't, I, I could keep you here another hour, but we'll wait till next time. We're, and the Bible tells us how it's going to do it. The Bible tells us how it's going to do it. So this scene of Revelation... Friends, I want to close with Daniel chapter 3. With, with a story 
This scene in Revelation 13 is similar to a scene in Daniel chapter 3 where a king made a decree that everyone should worship his image. And if you don't worship his image, you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. Basically, forced worship. Just like Revelation 13. Forced worship. Oh, but praise the Lord. Not everyone bows. Daniel chapter 3. There it says that there were three members of the Cleveland First Church that did not bow. <laughs> Amen. And what did, what, did, what did they say to the king in verse 17? If that is the case, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But, but, if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image. Friends, these young men didn't serve God for the loaves and the fishes. Amen. They didn't serve God. For, What's in it for me? Do you deliver me? Okay, then I'll serve you. Uh-uh. They worship God out of love because they love God. It was a joy to them. And unless you love God, it will be a burden to serve God. It will be a burden to come to church. It will be a burden to do what God asks you to do. You have to love the Lord. And the only way you love the Lord is you have that, you build and have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Just how a marriage, they do something for the other, not because they have to, but because they love the person. Whenever my wife says, can you give me a massage on my feet? Sure. Absolutely. Why? I love my wife. Amen. No problem for me. Now, somebody else, one of you may say, can you give me a massage on my feet? There's a massage place right down the road over there <laughs> where you can go. And they, only, and they only charge $35, so it's not bad. <laughs> friends, the love makes the difference. Love makes the difference, friends. It is no problem. It is no problem for a mother or father to give their life for their children yeah. because they love. It was no problem for these young men to give their lives. They said, God can deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still going to love him and serve him. Amen. So friends, knowing who the Antichrist is, knowing who the Antichrist helper is, is good. But if you don't have that relationship with Jesus, it does you no good. It does you no good. Revelation chapter 15. As my closing text. Verses 2 and 3. Re Revelation 15. There is going to come a time friends. When this beautiful nation that I love. And, and I love my United States of America. That God ordained and God blessed. You know when, when we say. Or people say God bless America. That is a fact. God has blessed his nation. God has blessed. It's still even a young nation. A little over 200 if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And God has blessed this nation. Because I do believe that God opened it up at the right time. But there according here to Bible prophecy. According here to Bible prophecy. There will come a time. When this nation will speak like a dragon. I love my country, friends, but I love my Lord. Yeah. I love my Lord. And I want to stand like these Hebrew boys that stood there before the king. Amen. And so here, Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. Here John says, Then I saw something like a sea of glass. He's talking about heaven. Mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast. Great. There will be people who have victory over the beast. Yes. Over his image and over his mark. And over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass 
having harps of God, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, friends. Amen. And the song of the Lamb. Yes. Friends, I want to pray for you this morning yes. that you stand like these young men did. Yes. That you stand like these young men did. You see, when the time comes, you, we need to be able and prepared to stand right now. Don't think that when crunch time comes, you're like, oh, what do I do? I'm going to stand. If right now you have a hard time standing, friends, we need to change that by the grace of God. Amen. By the grace of God, we need to really put on the armor of God and stand with God right now while there is still this freedom that, that we embrace in this country. Friends, the next time we look, we look at Revelation 13, we're going to see how this beast, how this nation is going to force it. And, and the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us. But meanwhile, friends, I appeal to you. I appeal to you, friends. You want to you wanna stand during the time of trouble, during the seven last plagues? You want to go to heaven? Yes. You better have your nose in this book. You better have a prayer life every day. There is no other way. There is no other way, friends. Friends, if, you, if that is your desire, I invite you to stand as I pray for you before we sing our closing hymn. Father in heaven, Lord God Almighty, I thank you very much because you put in place this nation. So many people are coming to this nation for what it stands for and what it believes. And Lord, I want to thank you for that. But Lord, your word is true and you do not lie. And soon, this nation will change. But Lord, I just ask that meanwhile it changes that you have us strengthen our faith and our walk with you. Amen. That we may draw closer to you every day and spend time with you in prayer, in communion, in reading of your word. So that when the time does come, we may be able to stand because we are standing already. So Father, bless your church. Bless every single child that is here. They are your children. They are your sons and daughters, and they want to be ready for when you come. Bless your church, not just here in Cleburne, but your church all around the world, wherever they may be. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.